Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to the December instalment of Todd and Dane's Indie Read Along. So, this is a thing that I host in conjunction with Todd the Librarian. To be honest, we've both been crazy busy in life recently, so we've both dropped off a little bit. But I'm trying to catch back up. So for December I read three of the Kirk Sandblaster books by Ollie Jacobs. Ollie is an indie author from here in High Wycombe. He actually gave me these books when I went to a party of his. I've read some of his other work before as well. So these are basically... It's like a sci-fi humour series. It's uh, reminiscent of, say, Douglas Adams. It also it kind of reminds me of Terry Pratchett's sense of humour, but it is very much sci-fi. The main character, Kirk Sandblaster, He's a bit of a dick to be honest, but he's deliberately a dick. He's kind of like one of those heroes that you love to hate, I guess. And uh, he has a sidekick, a two-headed dude called Zla, who uh, is on some of these covers, I believe. Is he here? There we go, there's Zla. So, um... I'm going to take you through these. These aren't necessarily the series in order because I think there are five books now and uh, he only had uh, three of them at hand. So the first one that I read was Kirk Sandblaster and the Ice Pirates of Lur. So the blurb here. Burr. He's back and this time he's chilly. Fresh from his adventures in the Dark Quadrant, Kirk Sandblaster is hired by the University of Government to explore. Along with Zla, he finds trouble at their port of call. Lur, an ice planet filled with angry ice pirates. And ice. Lots of ice. So get your Horgorian thermals on and grab a sandwich for Kirk Sandblaster and the Ice Pirates of Lur. Now, you can probably see all of these uh, green flags here. So these are actually grammar errors, unfortunately. I mean, it is an indie book, and this was one of the earlier ones as well. And it does get better later on in the series. Mostly these were just apostrophes in the wrong places or missing apostrophes where there should be some. However, I did also put some orange flags in for bits I liked. So let's, uh, let's, let's give you a quote here. So there's this bit here where uh, Zlar's hand gets injured, and uh, so it goes. Struggling to contain the contents of his stomach, Sam Blaster kept trying to offer solutions. I've got some phenobarbital if you want it. What's that? Some earth drug. To be honest, I don't think it applies to this situation, but, you know. Zlar looked at him. No what? Uh, when in doubt, have some drugs? I can't currently see through it, and I'm listening to something the Gurians call dubstep. Sounds funky. It really isn't. It's like dying a thousand deaths, being resurrected, and then dying a thousand more. Hey, I like dubstep. Then we have the bit where uh, Sam Blaster shouts, Navi, talking to the Navi computer, and the, the Navi computer goes, what is up, my dog? Just these little tiny, just little bits just make me laugh, especially a lot of the dialogue, I think. So in this one, as I read from the blurb, he goes to the uh, ice planet and deals with the ice pirates. It was okay. I will say with all these, you can read them as standalones as well. So for this one, I will probably give it... I'm going to give it a 3.5, but a low 3.5 because of those apostrophe and grammar mistakes. Uh, but like I say, those, those get fixed in the later books. So we'll move on to the next one I read, which was Kirk Sandblaster faces Montague Santiago. So the blurb for this one. Whoosh! Kirk Sandblaster thinks he's got the University Man of the Year trophy for the taking. After all, he saved the galaxy numerous times and won the game of Loria. Sure, he's wanted by the GAF, but that's a minor detail. The only thing standing in his way is a suave time adventurer named Montague Santiago. In the fifth of the Sandblaster series by Ollie Jacobs, follow Kirk and his Laurel Zarian comrade, Azla as they travel through space and time. Read as they face time madness, ancient dinosaurs, and the dark secrets of Sam Blaster's past. So this is cool because it sets up this kind of arch nemesis of Montague Santiago, who is arguably a more likable character than Sam Blaster, which I thought made it really interesting as well. And in this, it is, it's basically an adventure through time and space, as uh, Sam Blaster tries to win the University of Man of the Year competition. And so he ends up, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but he, he steals Montague Santiago's trip, uh, ship, sorry. So basically what happens is Santiago wins the Man of the Year competition, and Sam Blaster isn't too happy about that, so he ends up stealing his ship and finding out that, that he can actually time travel. So Santiago wins because he keeps averting these major disasters by travelling through time. And Sam Blaster's like, well, how do we know that? How do we know that, that, that you did do that? Uh, so, um, and then he steals the ship and does go back in time, and then causes a little bit of a kerfuffle, basically. Very funny. Uh, I really liked Montague Santiago as the foil in this as well. I did tab a few things out in this one. In, so this is when he finds out he hasn't won. In the mind of University's infamous rogue, something was terribly amiss. They've said my name wrong, he finally said. No, you lost. It was written down wrong. They've made a mistake. Sam Blaster, you lost. 
They must be confused, what with the bright lights and noise and other such distractions. Sandblaster, Zlar said, trying his best to be tactful. Face facts, you didn't win. Big whoop. Now sit down and let's just get this over with. Solarians weren't too good with tact, but Sandblaster couldn't accept it. He couldn't take on board that he, the man who single-handedly saved the galaxy's finances, maybe with Zlar's help, wasn't man of the year. Instead, he was watching some foppish dandy walk onto the stage and smugly take the award. His award. For those who didn't know who this figure taking the stage was, Missy Satulia and Narant were quick to fill them in. Montague Santiago was known as a time adventurer, a stark contrast to Kirk Sandblaster's moniker as a space adventurer. He would travel beyond the aspects of time and space, saving the world where he could and making sure that university was safe and, more importantly, right. He had stopped civil wars, cured venomous diseases, and stopped catastrophe from happening multiple times in multiple timelines. Then we have this bit where uh, Kirk confronts Montague Santiago, and this is Doctor Who reference here, I think. He goes, uh, how do you convince people about this wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey rubbish? I don't understand. The flibbity-flobbity stuff. Sonic what's it's and that. I like this as well, because this is quite realistic, so they're talking about Earth here, and he goes, So we should probably talk about Earth at this point, or at least what some historians refer to as Earth. For, you see, the Earth of today is much different from the Earth of yesteryear. That was the Earth that saw first contact with the Martians, the Earth that found itself blessed with technology that would kickstart hundreds of years of advancement. An Earth that would, quite quickly, fall to its own hubris. If you were to go to a university or travel agent these days and request a visit to Earth, you'd be taken to a nicely restructured planetoid based in the Globa Quadrant that had a decent proximity to Mars, revolved around a sun, and generally was a nice place to be. You could holiday in exotic hot countries, enjoy classic Earth dishes like fish and chips, curry and cyberized chicken. You could even, if you wanted to, ride roller coasters that took you through the very core of the planet. As a place, Earth was very, very nice to spend a weekend. But it wasn't Earth per se. No, it was a recreation of Earth, a holiday planet designed from the core up to resemble the Earth of old, for, you see, Earth itself died a long time ago, for when Earth's humans found themselves imbued with such large vaults in technological evolution, they did what they always did. They got greedy. We also have, this is, uh, what is this, is this, a, this is a Skyrim reference, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> uh, somebody says here, um, I mean, I was an adventurer once, until I took a pistol blast to the knee. So yeah, enjoyed Montague Santiago uh, more than uh, the Ice Pirates of Lure. I will give that a 4 out of 5. And we'll finally move on to here. Kirk Sandblaster faces Tetragedon by Ollie Jacobs. The uh, blurb here. ka -ching! As one of the richest men in Universia, a minor Tetra Crunch leaves Kirk Sandblaster without the finer things in life. That means no extravagant riches, no exotic planet trips, and definitely no expensive meats for his sandwiches. Therefore, along with his Zarian comrade Zlar, Sandblaster must travel to the one group who knows what's happened to his money, Tetra Bank. Get ready for another Kirk Sandblaster adventure featuring confused mercs, annoying rebels, ominous AI, vicious vending machines. So this one was probably my favourite. I think for a rating, I'll give this one a, I'll give it a 4.25 out of 5. Because it's not quite a 4.5, I don't think. But it is very well written. Again, there are none of the uh, grammar errors that, that, that were in that first one. And here, basically they go into this giant space station that is the bank. It's a bit like if the Death Star was a bank's headquarters and it stored all the information in. So they go inside because uh, Sam Blaster's account or whatever is no longer working. They kind of discover that nobody's accounts are working. The AI is a bit unhinged. They get locked inside. There are some bad guys in there who particularly have it in for Zla. And it's basically just a great little adventure. It reminded me in ways of the bit in Harry Potter when they break into Gringotts near the end. And uh, it had a similar vibe of like, you know, they go in and then they've got to try and get out. And there's obviously all this wealth around. And really, if you've got a lot of wealth around, you don't really want Kirk Sandblaster near it. Because he's not, not the most trustworthy of people. Let's put it that way. I don't want to make this video too long. So I don't want to go into all of these books. Because again, I usually just do the one book for the indie read-along. But I have really been enjoying these. There are, I think, two more in the series that I am missing that I now want to get to. You can read these as standalones as well. So if any one of these in particular kind of caught your attention, definitely check it out. The other thing I'd like to mention as well is that because Ollie is a local author to me, we've been talking about potentially doing an author interview. So let me know in the comments if you'd like uh, me to go around to his house, basically get a bit of footage of him and his dog and do an author interview. He's also running a campaign, which I'll link to below. Uh, through Unbound for his new book called Deep Down There, which is basically about a mysterious hole. I don't want to tell you too much more. But uh, Unbound is this kind of innovative publisher that basically they crowdfund publishing. So it's a bit like Kickstarter. You can go in, you can go and pledge 
to support the book. And once it reaches 100%, it goes into production, gets a lot better distribution, you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. But definitely recommend checking them out. So, give, give Ollie Jacobs a Google. So, that's it for my plans for December. In January, I have a few choices. And I haven't decided what I'm going to get to yet. But I have up there, I have uh, Duncan Ralston's book, uh, The Method. So, I might read that. I also have... Uh, West, West Richardson Street by Saqib Deshmukh, and he's another High Wycombe author. Actually, West Richardson, actually West Richardson Street is about 200 meters that way, something like that. It's where Little is. So every time I go to the shop, I walk down that road, and uh, I think it kind of tells the story of you know various generations of kind of immigrants living in High Wycombe. So I'm quite excited about that. I have some poetry that I might read. Uh, some short stories I have, um, oh, I forgot what it's called, but I have a, a book up there called by Michael G. Munns, who writes kind of, actually, humorous fantasy. His, his last book that I read is called uh, Zeus is Dead, and it's basically about the Greek gods, but in today's day and age, so they're all using Twitter and stuff, and then Zeus died. But that's by the by. So, um, yeah, that's what we're doing for the read-along. I will be back in January with some more thoughts on indie books. In the meantime, as always, be sure to let me know in the comments if you're going to check these books out. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.